and I'll just start this. Are you there? Hey, hey. I'm over here. I'm down here on the blue track. Cell phones are actually very minimally wireless. It's crazy. This research blew my mind. And also cell in cell phone doesn't mean what I thought it meant. Broadcasting from Nashville, Tennessee, offering a glimpse inside the music industry, shedding light on things they don't want you to know, and exposing some of the industry's biggest secrets. You're listening to the Turned Up Podcast, presented by Real Sound Productions. Here are your hosts, Jake Jones. Edit this out, Robert. And Robert Venable. Not going to edit this out at all. The hills are alive with the sound of turned up podcast. That is, ooh, what? What you actually reminded me of was Beverly Hillbillies. Oh, Texas Tea, black gold, oil. That oil, is, that is, yeah. Both. I was, I was too well, old for that show. I was gonna say <laughs> long before my time, but TV Land uh, was what my parents liked to watch during the day, and it was either go play outside. Or watch shows on TV Land, which was a combination of like old, old cartoons. I Love Lucy came on at night. During the day, of... it was Gunsmoke, Gilligan's Island, Green Acres. Mr. Ed? Was that one? N- not, not when I was watching it. Dang, I'm trying to remember what was on that. I didn't watch it, but I'm trying to think of what would be on that kind of show. I think we got, we got our first cable box in 1995, which was actually... Believe it or not, three years after the first smartphone. Oh, which is coincidentally what we're talking about today. Phones. All sorts of phones. Big ones, small ones, some as big as your head. You know, I, I, do you remember the SNL skit where uh, I think it's Chris Kattan is walking around? No, no, no. no. It's, uh, it's, well, it's Chris Kattan. Is it an SNL skit or is it? Well, Chris Kattan was Or SNL. is it Night at the Roxbury? Chris oh. Kattan and, and um, Will Ferrell? Uh, anyway, talking on the cell phone, maybe, maybe it's Will Ferrell, he's the agent or so he's talking on his cell phone and it like barely fits between his two fingers. Oh yeah. I, okay. I've seen whatever that is, good, which could be either, I guess. Because ironically, as technology has progressed, the phone went from pretty big and it was getting smaller. And then they came up the cell phone, which was weighed <laughs> so, multiple pounds and, uh, and then kept shrinking, kept shrinking, kept shrinking. And I think everybody thought the cell phone of the future was going to be itty bitty. I did. I know I thought that. Little did we know that I have a phone in my hand right this second. They're all so big. I can't reach the whole thing with one hand. They all brag about how big they are. Like, wait, like, are we still talking about cell phones? Right, yeah, Jake, come on. Get your head out of the cell phone towers. Oh, sorry. So, yeah, like they all brag about how big of screen size they have. Well, you have an extra two millimeters of screen size. <laughs> I'm like, you're basically <laughs> carrying around an iPad. Soon it'll be a television. With one of those little stinking, what are these things? Pop sockets on the back of them. Pop sockets. We were talking about the loop earlier, which is where I think I want to migrate to. Um, soon enough, like, it'll be like, man, I went down to Best Buy and got myself a 55-inch cell phone. 55-inch iPhone. <laughs> a flat screen. 4K. <laughs> Curved. So, Robert, did, did you know that cell phone calls are not sent from tower to tower? Well, the only reason I know that is because we researched this podcast, but I bet you at home didn't know that. At home? Does anybody actually listen to podcasts at home? I do, because I work from home. My wife does. Um, I listen to them in the shower. I don't listen to them unless I'm in the car, to be honest. Yeah. I mean, I feel like that's most people. Yeah, in the car, and I'm almost done with it, I'll bring it into the house or studio or wherever I'm going and continue listening if I have time. A lot of people at work or on their drive to work, they're not allowed to listen at work. Um, well, right now you're listening to the Turned Up Podcast, and I'm sitting across from one of the greatest human beings to ever live, and one of my best, my best friend in the whole world. Oh, thank you. Um, Mr. Robert Venable. He is a Grammy-nominated, Dove Award-winning producer, engineer, songwriter with Shoalsville. Shout out to Chad. Hey, Chad. Uh, he is a drummer for the band As We Ascend. Oh, that's true. Um, of course, a multi-instrumentalist. The guy can play guitar, piano, drums, banjo, banjitar. I, I can't. Sitar, I can't. flute. I can't play any of the tar. <laughs> I'm not any of the tar players. 
<laughs> um, that's, that's false. Actually, he's just sent over a demo today of a song he's writing for As We Ascend because we're working on a new record. <clears throat> no. Uh, actually, we are working on a new record. And if you want to get in on the ground floor, Literally, uh, yeah. go to asweascend.com. You can sign up and be a uh, label executive. But it's kind of cool. We do things differently because we, we set up a Dropbox for all of our label executives and they got to hear or they are continually getting to hear the, the demos as our band members are hearing them. So I send a <laughs> demo over. I'm like, hey guys, what do you think of this? And the fans in our private Facebook page who have access to that private Dropbox folder get to hear them the same time our bandmates do. Literally, uh, a song today, the song you sent over, I'm It's not fairly, even in there yet. Oh, I was about to say, I'm fairly certain some of our fans heard it before I did. But. I think they did, actually, to be honest. I know a couple of did. Um, so, so not only can he play just about anything, is he a wizard and master in the studio, uh, he has the credits to prove it, having worked with uh, clients all the way from Kelly Clarkson to 21 Pilots, Mute Math, DMX, Megadeth. Um, the list goes on. He's incredibly talented. He's an amazing friend and is the winner uh, of two consecutive cheese smelling competitions uh, hot off the press. Yeah. Just happened uh, earlier. Well, later last week. Um, and he's going to be getting the award uh, the first part of this week. Uh, why don't you tell me about that? How did you... What did you have to do to win those competitions? Because from what I understand, it's far more involved than just simply smelling cheese. It is, it is. Um, and I, first of all, I want to thank all of my fans who supported me while I was training um, for both of my wins. And if I win one more time, you know, I get the uh, coveted uh, third curd award, and I'm excited about that. You've been gunning for that third curd for a while. Yeah, it's uh, 18 consecutive years I've tried. Um, and I've gotten two in a row now. I'm going for the third curd next year. Uh, but my favorite cheese, the smell, I'm actually a, a big fan of like the Rocklet. Um, I go along with like the Gruyere. Um, it, it's sometimes the butter case. Um, so how, so, but how, do, how is, how is this done competitively is my question. Cause it, oh. well, I, I had never heard of it before today. You were telling me about it earlier. I think it's fair to assume that everyone listening has been to a Walmart. If you think of a room as big of a, as a, a Walmart, a standard Walmart size, just completely emptied out, um, nothing, no shelves or anything, but just lo- long rows of tables. Okay. Now picture thousands of people at these tables, thousands of pe- pieces of like cheese in front of these thousands of people. And what you do is you smell one, you pass it down. Smell one, you pass it down. Smell one, you pass it down. So what happens if you're at the, like the very end of the, oh, the, of cheese, the line? The cheese smells the same. It's fine. Okay. That, that's actually sometimes a benefit because you can take more time and without the stresses of passing it down. Fair enough. You know, being the first one, everybody's waiting on you. Everybody's looking down the table like, Where's the cheese? Pass okay. me the cheese. And sometimes they start chanting, pass the cheese. And it, it gets to you. It I, really I can only you. imagine that, um, that kind of stress. Yeah, the great meltdown of 97 happened um, because of a chant like that. So, I thought that was because the AC broke. Um, yeah, and then the nacho cheese started melting all over the table. It yeah. was pretty bad. It was, Bummer. Yeah, it was. Uh, but it is a really good thing to do. And I highly recommend Googling cheese smelling competitions and applying for any that you find online. And please let us know if you do, because that's <laughs> totally made up. <laughs> Jake Jones over there with all the jokes. And yes, you must say Jones when you say Jake uh, in referring to this gentleman, because he has earned the right to be called by his first and last name at the same time. Maybe it's just because Jake is so common. Well, I feel like that's... Isn't Jones really common? Isn't like the whole phrase keeping up with the Joneses based off of how common Jones is? Yeah, but when you say them together, it becomes a little more unique. What if you say it simultaneously like, Jones. There are lots of people that that I am known as Jake Jones. I don't have any other name. It's just Jake Jones. I hear a lot of clients that you and I work with together calling you Jake Jones all the time. What's up, Jake Jones? Like, hey, Jake Jones. I say it just because I think it's funny. Um, but Jake Jones over there with the jokes is not a professional comedian, not even an amateur comedian. Uh, I don't think <laughs> he's even try to be even <laughs> funny because nothing he says is ever funny. I'm just laughing for random reasons after he talks. But he is. You're so nice. If you ever look at the Billboard charts. And look up there, way at the top. You have to scroll a while if you start at the bottom. Go way up to the top where like the number one is. You'll see songs that Jake had. I'm sorry, that Jake Jones has either uh, written, mixed, produced, played on, or all of the above sang on because he's a singer of the band As We Ascend, formerly the guitar player of of uh, We As Human, but currently of As We Ascend as well. Um, you also have done so much mixing and producing and songwriting, also with Shoalsville Music. Shout out to Chad. What up, Chad? Um, our <laughs> intro is so long. I'm going to make it longer by doing this awkward pause. Huh. Yeah. Anyway, back to you, Jake Jones. Um, amongst all of the different awards and rock song, rock album of the year, um, the, all these awards and accolades hanging on the walls of this beautiful studio that we're sitting in right now, by the way. Um, oh, thank I'm a little you. envious of this wood wall that's behind me. 
I want in my next studio. It's a pretty rad wall. I'm not lying about it. And in the up lights that you have make it look completely epic. I like it. The blue. It's like, it's like feels it's, good. It's made for Instagram, I think. Feels that's the only reason they're there. You should bring people in here just to take pictures for Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> like rent out the studio. Um, but one thing that you are actually infamous for is your ability to collect and arrange to size, like by size. Um, what, is there a word for that? Like it's not alphabetically, numerically, sizably. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, nose hairs that you collect from um, public transportation. Uh, it, nothing. Uh, you have strict rules um, that like you can't be from like someone's personal car, or from a house, or something like that. But it has to be from public transportation, um, uh, and like device, not devices. What would it be called? Modes of public transportation, I guess. Uh, you'd know more about it than I would. Why don't you expand on that? Yeah. So it's something I started back in the early two thousands. Uh, was I was actually sitting on a bus uh, and just noticed a strange looking hair. I could tell it wasn't from uh, the South Pole. But I could also tell it wasn't from the North Pole. It wasn't from a pole at all? It wasn't from a pole at all. So how, how do you tell the difference in, from like a nose hair from any other body hair? So they're strikingly similar to an eyebrow hair. I can't tell them apart. Where you have to look is the root. Uh, the root is what really sets it apart. And uh, actually, I have a blog, um, jakejones.com slash uh, nose hair collection. Please I, make that a subdomain. <laughs> Let's put something there so if someone goes. <laughs> um, J- jakejonesproductions.com slash nose hairs. Uh, ooh, I, I'm going to do that tonight. You have to put something there, when, no matter what it is. <laughs> um, no, but, but what I've actually found uh, recently, my fast food obsession has led me to realize that you can find a lot more nose hairs uh, in your food at McDonald's than you can in any mode of public transportation. Uh, and so that's where I started looking. And that's really where my collection has started to expand. I've got wow. hairs from all around the world. I've got hairs from all kinds of different ethnicities and all kinds of species, not just human. I've got animal nose hairs. Uh, uh, you showed me your amphibian nose hair collection, which I thought was intriguing. I, I didn't even know they had nose hairs. I just, uh, I actually just started uh, collecting chicken nose hairs. What's your favorite flavor of nose hair? Just real quick. I'll um, from the hip. Well, the purple, the purple. I, I don't know. I couldn't tell you what flavor it is, but the purple one. It's like ices. When you get ices, like use like the purple. They say it's grape. It doesn't taste anything like a grape. No, not at all. But we call it grape. It's just purple flavored. It's just purple flavored. Yeah. That's yeah, my favorite candy. Um, and, uh, my favorite flavor of Kool-Aid is red. No, that's, <laughs> that's actually a lie. My favorite flavor of Kool-Aid is green. They have green Kool-Aid? They do. It's hard to find. It's lime. I love lime. I love lime. I love lamp. Are you just looking at random things and saying that you love them? Isn't I love... Wait. That's that's the next that's the line. Quote. That's the next line in the quote. Was, that's the, we'll Rick, see. are you just looking at random things and saying you love them? Wait. So I'm quoting... Yeah, no, you're right. Thank yeah, you. I, I always get that confused with... Um, all I need is this lamp. All I need is this lamp. That's all I need. That's all I need. From, yeah, Steve Martin. The, the jerk. The jerk. And yeah, that man... Fail movie quote fail, which doesn't say much about me because I don't. Know it's okay. You're editing it. this one. You can just edit it all out. I'm leaving all this in. Oh, including this statement. Beautiful. Yeah. Okay. So that's me. That is you. My nose hair. <laughs> that's you and your. That's that's you and a nose hair. Uh, I'm. I. <laughs> I've already a nostril. I've already gotten <laughs> a, a a will written out and notarized. So after my passing, they will open a museum in my honor. Uh, Robert, I've put you in charge of curating it. <laughs> I'm the nose hadn't, hair curator. Hadn't talked to you about it yet, but no, I'm sure you'd agree. Just finding out about this now. Um, since just you're moments after forever. You found out about your own collection. <laughs> <laughs> oh, by the way, go on to all you beautiful ears and ugly ones. If you have those ugly people, put, put your, your hands, hands down. down. Um, like and subscribe. Oh, like yeah. and subscribe. Uh, you can subscribe, comment, leave a rating. On iTunes, Stitcher, uh, Spotify. Spotify. We're actually going to be doing a lot more work with Spotify. It's coming quickly. Um, but we love, love to read your it's reviews. Hilarious. Um, you guys are so freaking funny. Leave a hilarious review. Leave a good review. A kind-hearted review. Tell us that you hate us. We'll read the funniest ones on air. Um, but seriously, you have no idea how much that helps us. And uh, and that rating, that rating, um, it. It, you may feel like your rating is insignificant, but you really don't nah. realize what it says to other people. And we have some incredible opportunities coming to us right now as a direct result of, of, of you rating yeah. and reviewing. And it lifts our spirits sometimes. We're just having one of those moments where like, is anybody listening to us? And we see a, oh, look at that. Hello. A couple hello. ratings. Hello, hello. Um, and so if you're, if you're, you are only have a second, like if you're traveling or I'm about to get off that bus, 
uh, about to walk into work, whatever you have to do back to walk in the house after work, whatever it may be, and you only have a second, just hit that five star thing. Um, you're already in the app. You're already listening to us. Just do it real quick and close your phone um, and get along with what you're doing. But if you have one and a half seconds, hit that five star button and then write a little something funny about um, how Jake just turned 12. I didn't, well, I didn't turn 12. It's acting like a true 12 year old. Stop right there. it. Stop pitching a fit or you will go to your room. Don't make me turn this podcast around. <laughs> I'm old enough to have my own phone. So we're talking about telephones today. Okay, so the thing about a telephone and, and the reason the idea hit us is it's something we use every day. Literally every single day, multiple times a day. And it's something that human beings, especially if you live in America, you've used probably, well, you've used it multiple times a week your entire life. Um, I'll tell you this right now. First of all, I'm going to interject with all sorts of random phone facts this entire night that we're doing this podcast. I love it. Um, but but right now, the fa- the first fact in my collection of facts is that you know that any at any moment, an adult that owns a cell phone, 90% of them are within arm's reach of their cell phone at any given moment. I'm not right now. You're holding yours. Oh, That's wow. what's in your hand. Mine's here. Wow. That's 100%. We are beating the odds, Jake, as you were saying. Hashtag winning. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, you can do anything. You can shop, which I heard another statistic that 76% of people who own a smartphone shop from their phone and 79% of those people um, actually make purchases. And uh, uh, I do all kinds of shopping. I do my Christmas shopping. I do... I buy music gear. Yeah. Yeah, I I literally... Like you can buy groceries from your cell phone. Literally. To quote Parks and Rec, my favorite show right now. We, you can even podcast from a cell phone. And Thank you can listen to the podcast on a cell phone. Right. And you can make calls, which is, if you don't know what that is, Google that. But you can actually make telephone calls from a cell phone. It's <laughs> yeah, using right. your mouth. No, no, it's like speech to text, but no, different. No, yeah, It's real time speech to text. Yeah, maybe it's translated what, like in back your in voice. The, back the in the side. 1900s. No, dude, seriously. It's, it's your own voice on the other end, too. What? It's like a regular, like those old fashioned phones, but new. And you can, it's wireless. Shut up. Same phone. Shut up. It's not even an app. It's a thing. Speaking of apps, did you know that <laughs> 60% of smartphone owners don't download apps from month to month? Like in a given month, 60% aren't downloading an app. Yeah, I haven't. Well, Only 40% of cell phone owners download an app every month. I did not download an app last month. I did. But I downloaded several apps the month before because I like gaming and I like photography. Only I play like little kid games on my phone. I love it. Yeah, Just the, mindless, the mindless ones sitting on the toilet playing a game well you and i with what we do for a living we're sitting here looking at all this techie gear I you were about to say we're sitting on the toilet a lot <laughs> for what we do for a living we sit on the toilet so often <laughs> many times together which i don't know how that would work well that's why we got pop sockets so we could hold our phone with one hand so we can hold each other's hands oh perfect should we put that on the podcast i did uh, i don't know if people should know that no edit this out robert okay not gonna edit this out at all people at home i'm leaving this in Note to myself in the future, leave this in. (laughs) Note to myself in the future, also leave that in. (laughs) (laughs) We're nerds. Okay, we should dive in. We've got stuff to talk about. We do, we do, we do. Okay, so um, I I don't, the, the purpose of this podcast, this episode is to talk about how phones work, but to know how they work, we have to know a little bit of history. So I'm going to try... Uh, and, and go through yeah. this as quickly as possible. Let's make it a quick journey. Um, so the evolution of the telephone starts with the telegraph. It does. Um, we wanted to be able to send. Uh, we wanted to be able to send messages to people that we were not in close vicinity to, and writing a letter and sending it via horse across the country. It still takes a while. Or across the ocean. You know, horses don't swim too well. Not not too quickly. Um, it it took a long time, and if there was maybe a, a war. Or, or, you know, there were enemies coming. You needed to get that information out quickly. Yeah. So uh, I'm not going to go into names because um, that's not the point. But the telegraph came along. And that's, that allowed us to send... Think Morse code. Yes, Morse code, which... Dots um, and dashes. Everybody knows SOS. Dun, 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 dun. Yeah. Right. Well, and, and I actually know Morse code because I had some walkie-talkies. I think we actually talked about this. We, we had the did, same we, ones. We told, yeah, the exact same ones. Gray with a black and a little orange thing and on the end. And they have Morse code little on a little placard yep. sticker on, on the actual unit. And I had a button. You could send the beeps. Right. Well, I learned it from Cub Scouts. My dad was in the Coast Guard oh, at that's one awesome. point and made me learn how to... Actually, he had a set of those <laughs> um, Morse code transmitters. I don't know what they're called. Telegraphs? 
well, maybe that's what as simple as what they could be called. Literally just like a battery plugged into some kind of electrical circuit that buzzed when you tapped the button. And he taught me that from that. Yeah. So the first telegraphs, um, very simple. Uh, it literally was just an, uh, every time you'd push it down, uh, it connected two metal leads that would send an electrical signal down a wire uh, to the receiving end. And then that would, every time that electrical pulse would come, it would replicate yeah. the dot or dash. It'd either be a light or a buzz or something like that. Uh, yeah, on that, that you were trying end. to send. Yep. Um, so this was great and all, but you could only send one message at a time. And that was really inconvenient. However, I have a really fun fact. Go, Jake, go. Okay. You didn't go when I said, go, Jake, go. Okay. That's my fact. Okay. Oh, I get it. In the early 1800s, it was super popular uh, to misspell English words using their phonetic equivalent, uh, like the word cat. You'd use a K instead of a C. Uh, While this is mostly a short-lived fad, uh, there's one that actually stuck uh, in its abbreviated form. Um, that, uh, that abbreviation was all correct, which is like, gotcha, bro. All correct. All correct. Not a way we talk today, but a way they talked back then. Sure. Uh, and so the cool way to do it was to replace the, the O for the A and then a K for the C. So it was shortened to O and K for all correct. But because Morse code was cumbersome and it took a long time to dot dash your way through an entire sentence... Uh, in the equivalent of, of like today's 10, four, which means, you know, heard you got gotcha. clear Roger that Roger. Yep. <laughs> um, it, uh, it, they, when you would send a telegraph, when you would send a, a Morse code signal, uh, they would wait for the receiving end to send back the letters. O K, And that let that let the sender know that they had received it. And if they didn't get an okay back, then they would send it again until eventually huh. they got their okay back. Uh, and this, is, uh, among other reasons, is why that abbreviation actually stuck Boom. and became incredibly popular. And I could go way deeper into that uh, also because K is That's a whole other podcast, right? K is K is not a, a frequently used letter in the English language. Yeah, it's, it's one of my least favorites. Sorry to all my K starting people's <laughs> names. Friend. And so whenever you whenever you have OK, it's really striking. Get your attention. That makes so sense. It's kind of like, pointy. The OK Mart, the OK Deli, the OK whatever. It's weird to do in cursive too. And then, and then nowadays we actually create an entire word, OKAY for OK. We unabbreviated o- an abbreviation, <laughs> right? Improperly. Yeah, improperly. Yeah. <laughs> um, but so that Frickin was millennials. <laughs> yeah, aren't you a millennial technically? I think technically so are you. Technically so am I, even though I very much am not. But yes, I actually sit in the. There's a gray area. No denying. Yeah, whatever. So there, there were um, like those telegraphs which were single, like frequency, like a, just a buzz or a light. Um, but then the electric telegraph, invented by Elisha Gray, could actually send different tones and frequencies. Now, while it wasn't of much great use, it did become the predecessor to the modern synthesizer, which I think is kind of cool. It's cool that he came up with these ideas and and was able to right put them into practice. He's like, hey, we should be able to send Morse code, but in different tones. Like, that'd be cool. What if we could, cust- like, your customized ringtone. It does the same thing, but sounds cooler. I think, well, the problem I think they were trying to solve, again, was to send multiple signals through a single line. So maybe using different frequencies or something. I this don't know. is for you. This is for you. Well, uh, there were uh, several minds working to uh, to solve this problem and to be able to actually send spoken word uh electrically from one person to another yeah and on february uh of 1876 valentine's day yep uh the official patent for the telephone was submitted not once but twice wait 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 so when mr alexander graham bell went to the patent office why would he do it more than once he didn't you said it was twice that's right i heard you there was another guy Wait, two people own the patent. I've never heard this in history class. It was always Alexander Graham Bell invented the phone. Next question. Right. Well, the patent can only be granted to one for the telephone. And so at 1130 a.m., Alexander Graham Bell submits his patent for the telephone. At 1.30 p.m., Elisha Gray (laughs) submits his patent for the telephone. Too slow, bro. And of course, a month later, granting it to 
uh, Alexander Graham Bell, of course, solidifying him in the annals of history as the inventor of the telephone forever and ever. Amen. That's how I know it. Um, so there's a, there's a ton of speculation and even conspiracy, and I'd, I'd love to hear you weigh in on this. Uh, one of the biggest ones being that Elisha Gray's, one of his understudies, uh, was, uh, was paid off by Bell a hundred bucks to allow him to peek at Elisha Gray's invention of the telephone. Thus, uh, when when Bell's patent was submitted, it was strikingly similar to Elisha Gray's patent that was submitted. Yeah, but like a hundred dollars then, I mean, I'm not going to discount that. If you want to send me a hundred bucks, I'll take it. But a hundred bucks now is nothing like what a hundred bucks was then. Right. We're probably talking closer to, you know, at least a thousand bucks. So he did this, he spied on it, and like tons of legal battles ensued from that point, ultimately resulting in Alexander Graham Bell being victorious and secu- uh, securing him in the history books as the, quote, inventor, end quote, of the telephone. And that's how I read it in history books these days, because I read a lot of history books. <laughs> And all about telephones. <laughs> I just <laughs> telephone history books. Leave them on the back of the toilet and just rip one open from now from time to time. And uh, you're ripping something when you're on the toilet. <laughs> I'm like, let's read about telephones again. So Ooh. I thought this was interesting, uh, and I, I mean, I think we kind of all know this from the movies, but early early telephone users were connected via tele uh, switchboard operators. Yeah, uh, and my grandmother actually worked for Bell South. That's uh, fascinating to me, actually. And that, that was her job. So you'd, you'd hop on the phone and you'd say, connect me to G47. And G47 is not a real phone number, Jake. I, well, we'll get there. Oh. Um, and, uh, and then the operator, usually a female, would say, yes, sir, give me one moment. And then she would literally patch you in with patch cables from your phone to that other phone, causing it to ring. It would send an electrical yeah. signal to their phone. They'd pick it up and, and a, start talking. A little light would light up over the patch bay. Like just you've seen them before. It's a big wall of of holes of dots where they plug in the cables. And right above every cable hole, there was a little light that would light up if um, someone was either cranking the phone on the other end to generate the electricity to light it up, um, or the more modern ones. I say more modern ones. Still talking about the earliest early twentieth century here, um, or maybe even the late nineteenth century, where you'd be able to pick up the he- the handset headset and it would um, relay an electrical signal there, light up a, a light and the the lady would be like, hey, let's connect the dots. Well, I thought it was really interesting. And when I think of, um, you know, phone switching automation, which is basically what every landline is now, um, it first started popping up still in the 1800s. 1891 was the first, was when the first uh, automated switchboards were, were coming Crazy, around, man. Um, starting to do away with, uh, with, with switchboard operators. So my grandmother, switchboard operator, uh, for Bell South, real quick, uh, and this one isn't in our notes, but it's worth noting. Um, Alexander Graham Bell, of course, uh, started his company, which was Bell South, and that was that that was one of the first big monopolies. Sure. And part of why there is, if not the reason why there is legislation today against companies monopolizing. And they made Ooh. Bell South break up into multiple companies. The, Interesting. The leading company and, and the lasting one being AT&T. Well, AT&T was actually a different company at the time, hired to handle all of his long distance telephone calls. I didn't know that. Yeah. So they took over um, handling all his long distance phone calls or telegraph messages um, via his, via his um, audible telegraphs. His oh, wow. Phone, and uh, disbanded some point uh, in the 80s and came back back around and uh, is now one of the leading as you know um, telephone service providers and they were actually the very first telephone service provider um, and exclusively uh, for the first iPhone I had to switch to AT&T just for that okay we're jumping way too far in the future but let's, all relevant let's go back to uh, to the 19 well the first phones the eight, late 1800s the, up and, the two piece it wasn't even a flip phone right it was just a like a mouthpiece and an earpiece if you've seen it any i mean any of those hello, old black and white hello. movies yeah say connect me margaret to uh the old man down the street <laughs> say cling 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 you've got it mr smith <laughs> that's exactly it put me through to dr dr peterson please I mean, it was it was just like that, especially in small towns. Oh, did you know that the, those um, those operators, like your grandmother, would sit there and often uh, they just had to listen to the conversation. Yep, they had to know when to disconnect. 
Um, cause there's no like, Oh, they hung up button. It's like, you have to listen for words. And but so my mom told me a story about this cause there was, there was some protocol for that because you weren't they, like, I could be misremembering, but I think they weren't allowed to listen. They had they some way of knowing, to. but my mom said that my grandmother would come home. They lived in Paducah, Kentucky. Uh, she'd come home with all kinds of scuttlebutt from all the neighbors. She knew everybody's dirt. <laughs> scuttlebutt does sound like a problem, right? Anyway, it, well, it is no yeah. matter which way you look at it. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah. So in the late 1920s, um, the technology was really zooming along, and they were starting to invent smaller and smaller components. And uh, it was it was practically the future. They were able to combine that mouthpiece and that earpiece into what? a single part that you would hold in your hand. Two, 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 two in one. <laughs> Can imagine. That. Say, are you tired of holding a piece to your ear and talking into a different piece? <laughs> Try our new all-in-one combination telephone. At least that's the ad you would read in the Sears and Roebuck because you were <laughs> right before you ripped it out to wipe your back end. Oh in man. The outhouse. They had like party lines that came around eventually, and we'll get to that. But they would actually play ads on there. Really? They'd play advertisements. How funny. Smart. I mean, kind of. Right? Wait, they're going to listen anyway. So yeah. the, uh, the very first intercontinental call was made. Drum roll. Do you know when it was? Uh, I'm going to take a stab. First, inter- probably the 40s. 1927. Whoa, I was way off. Well, so it wasn't. Uh, it wasn't what it became. It was actually uh, made using radio waves, but it was still a phone call. Uh, what do you mean? We, radio waves are what they're done now, right? With the antennas, we see them everywhere. Uh, well, we'll get to that too, but that's a big misconception, a misconception that I had as what? well. Me too. Uh, I already know the answer to that. Cell phones are, all, are, are actually very minimally wireless. It's crazy. Um, it's, this research blew my mind. And also cell in cell phone doesn't mean what I thought it meant. Same. Um, so... Uh, it was actually, um, they started in 1955 and finished in 1956 laying the very first, uh, transatlantic phone line, um, allowing, uh, allowing the U S to call Europe. Uh, by the way, just to backtrack a little bit, that first phone call was made from New York city to London. I wonder what they said uh, in 1927, but, um, hello. Hello. <laughs> I don't understand you. <laughs> Yo, speak up, please. <laughs> my, my New York accent is horrible. <laughs> hey, is this Domino's? <laughs> Trying to order a pizza. <laughs> I don't know. That's, Say. I'm, I'm stereotyping right now. That's terrible. <laughs> is that what New Yorkers do? They just order uh, Domino's pizza? I, actually, no. Not Domino's at all. It's, that's sacrilegious They right would there. just go down the street and get a dollar slice. My sincere apologies. Oh, um, to New Yorkers. New York pizza is delicious, uh, is. but I like Chicago better. Um, it, that That's line disgusting. in 55, 56 uh, was, was called the TAT-1. Ooh. The first of very many. Trendy. Uh, did you know that mobile phones first showed up in... Oh, well, first, guess what year? Mobile phones? Yeah. The 80s? Mm-hmm. Maybe late 70s internet? Probably, but not. It was actually 1946. Shut up. In cars. They were incredibly expensive, like ridiculously. Wait, did you say in cars? Yeah. So the first mobile phones were in cars. Do you remember when we were in LA and we went into a gift shop right there off Hollywood Boulevard? <gasps> Do you remember seeing the phone in that hoopty? Do you remember what I said? No. I said, oh, they must have added that. Yeah. Like we, we, we both, yeah, we were like, man, there must have been some sort of aftermarket thing it's they just added. now hitting me. Because that car is from the 50s, but mm-hmm. it has a phone in it. Like it there's did. no way they had that. It was pimped out. It, it was, was nice. Wasn't it one of Elvis's cars? I probably. Oh, that's what they were advertising. Yes. And it was a very, it was a land yacht. It was huge. Like you could run that into a wall and the wall would crumble. <laughs> um, but it had a telephone in it. And we're like, oh, that was weird why they did that. Now they just like changed the whole date, like appearance of this whole car. Um, but apparently, yeah, uh, 1946 in cars, it showed up and they were incredibly expensive, like I said, and, uh, it actually required that very few other people use the phone at the same time. Um, like in the town. Right. Um, so, because I guess it used up a lot of bandwidth. What, if you want to call it. That, that it, wasn't a term the at the same, time, but, yeah. um, yeah, that is insane. Uh, so something I thought was really crazy about that. Uh, one year later, uh, Bell Labs, uh, from... Alexander Graham Bell's namesake. Interesting. Uh, 1947, they started uh, coming up with this plan for different segments or cells. Ooh, um, think about that for a second. Forming a network, allowing cells. people to uh, to make 
calls from their car much more easily and conveniently. However, the technology just wasn't there. Um, it was a hexagonal cell network. And this is important because this plays in directly to how our cell phones work these days. Yes, take that, that uh, hexagonal cell network plant, phrase and plant that in your brain. So in the 70s, you know, a few decades later, 1973, Motorola, a company we all know and love, announced and demonstrated the very first completely untethered phone um, called the Dynatac 8000X. It just sounds rad, like from the future. 8000X. We tried the first 7,999 and they weren't as good as this one. <laughs> <laughs> we name our phone serially. Um, <laughs> we should, I like, why would you start at 8,000? I mean, you had to have done the first 7,000. I don't know. Probably the same reason you start checks at, at like a high number. So I pick a random like number. It's like your first number. Right. It's like, <laughs> check number one. Whenever I reorder checks, I pick some random number to make them think I actually keep track of them. I'm like, uh, yeah, I'm at 4,700. 4, so if you could just do the next one at 4,701, that'd be great. What's depressing is you know that there's someone listening to this podcast right the second that's like, what's a check? Oh, they're magic pieces of paper. You just write a random number on it and give it to the clerk, and then they, they it pays for your stuff. You have money. Look at that whole pad of money. You can just rip one off. I told my mom. I remember telling my right, mom that in the thing, store. Man. I wanted a toy. She's like, I don't have money for them. Let's just I write a check. See it right there. <laughs> um, just write the number, give it to them, and let's be gone. I'm going to open up my transformer. So the Dynatac 8000X weighed two and a half pounds, Holy which is crap. ridiculous. Um, Steve Jobs would roll over for that one. Um, that has that, That's not something that the iphone would boast i bet steve jobs had one (laughs) he probably did dissected it a million times um it would last a whole get this battery life of 20 minutes and only cost in today's money counting for inflation 10 grand ten thousand dollars you can make a 20 minute phone call and uh and it weighed two and a half pounds so like what's a practical reason for having this thing i mean just, like just to be the guy that has one of those things uh, or the president in case there's some sort of national emergency so i think military being like in one of the little rover mobiles um out there need to communicate like the navigators and uh, not the navigators the um the explorer what are they called the ones that are on the front line that go and like explore the land to see if there's any enemies up there i can't remember what they're called uh it's just escaping me right now anyway they'll go and survey the land and then report back oh hey we've got enemy camp set up at blah 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 Instead of using their radios, maybe they could be driving around. I don't know. There's not going to be cell phone towers out there, though. So I take that back. Radio? They still use radio, I think. The well, same towers? So what's interesting is uh, you still have Bell, who has the monopoly in the world sure. on all things phones. And right. why didn't they come up with it? I mean, they had this idea 30 years earlier. Sure. Um, but the problem is they were still, even up into the 1970s, trying to figure out and work out a way to wirelessly make calls from cars because that's where they thought the technology was going. They thought that that was the way the future was being able to make a call from your car, which it is and illegal in in a lot of States now. Um, (laughs) Right. (laughs) But that was, that was, they were still working on that, that cell network for cars. And then Motorola comes out and is like, bam, we got this on lock. So after the $10,000, 20 minute, two and a half pound phone, what happens? The phones get smaller. The battery life gets better. The cost Ooh. goes down as they, they get better at making these and mass producing. The market starts to starts to grow. Uh, and uh, they actually released this phone a year later. So they, they debuted it in 1973, but it, it came out in 74. Right. Um, let's fast forward to 1992. <laughs> and this might sound troubling. On I'm walks troubling. into the scene, the first smartphone. Wait, that, 92? 92. That blew my mind. Not I, the iPhone? I was, I thought the iPhone was the, the huh. genesis of the smartphone. It was not. Okay. Um, it was 1992 and it was, uh, it was done, it was made by IBM and it was called the Simon Personal Communicator. Take a stab at how much it costs. Now think about how much you paid for your iPhone 10s. I know how much I paid for mine and I have no idea. I have no idea what the first smartphone would cost. First smartphone. If we know the first cell phone was 10 grand. Now this one's got a freaking computer chip in it. 20 grand? I have no idea. 1100 bucks. So like same like, price we're paying for our phones now. <laughs> right? It was $1100. So uh, jacked up. It had a four and a half by one and what? Well, 1.4 inch LCD touchscreen, 
uh, which came with a stylus to be able to use, had one hour of battery life. Wow. Uh, it had everything from apps to email and even predictive text. How did I not even hear about this? Right. Um, and if you had bad cell reception uh, or were running low on minutes or, or just... I remember those days. ...wanted a better phone call because you were talking to your honey, um, you could connect hey. it to a landline. Uh, just a nearby landline. You just plug it in. You just plug it in. You can make a phone call. Genius. Um, so that was that was 1992. 15 years later, 2007, the iPhone is revealed. Um, it was about half that price, uh, starting at 499 up to 599. That was for the four and eight gigabyte models. Um, it had a three and a half inch widescreen, eight hours of talk time, 250 hours standby. That's incredible, right? I don't remember that. Um, it had, of course, tons of great apps and everything that's, that we know. That's more than 10 days of standby time. But do you remember the big competitor to the iPhone at the time? Uh, was it a smartphone? It was the BlackBerry. Oh, yeah. Okay. I right? remember that. Because you could, you could still you know, check you could your email. email and it had a QWERTY keyboard on it. It had a QWERTY keyboard. That was what really hurt the first iPhone because... It did not have a multi-touch screen. You can only use one finger at a time. And so if you're trying to send a text really fast, you still just, you just use your thumb or your finger. Huh. Uh, and so it really killed it for a lot of business owners, you know, buying contracts and, and getting them, you know, for their whole businesses, yeah. they were still using the BlackBerry. I knew a lot of business owners who were using uh, Blackberries, like all the, like the multi-millionaires that I, I have to say that I knew a lot of them. The ones that I did know were using Blackberries when everybody else was using like iPhones. That was interesting. So here's what I want to know is now that we've gone through the history, how does it work? That's a great question. Uh, we, it's a deep question. Um, so the first phones were actually fairly simple and stayed largely that way for a long period of time. Let's talk about the landline. Uh, everybody's had a landline. At um, some point. I got well, my first, wait, they might not. We're talking right? to a younger audience too. Well, I got my first landline oh, man. in 1990. 1990, uh, 1995. If you ever had a dial-up computer, there had to have been a, li- a landline. Right. Um, if you have one of those things that has like a coiled up cable, <laughs> and if it doesn't even have that, it might be like, it might look like your TV remote, um, but when you try to change the channel, it just goes bam, 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 or beep, beep, <laughs> boop, 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 when you push the buttons. Um, you might have a, a landline at your house. <laughs> Any um, phone that's not a cell phone. Ask an adult. <laughs> 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 but I mean, think about it, the landline. Okay, we've got a mouthpiece. That's where your voice is transmitted from your mouth um, as sound waves. And these waves vibrate a disc. Well, we've talked about this a little bit uh, briefly in previous podcasts, but the sound waves vibrate a disc that's connected to a piston at the center of the disc. Picture this in your brain. Much like a microphone. Exactly like a microphone. And uh, that piston compresses and decompresses little bits of carbon granules. Um, so, I mean, if you smash a charcoal briquette, like the very, very, very tiny little black pieces of charcoal, essentially is what it is. It's yeah. carbon um, in a casing. And it causes an electrical current that's flowing through it to fluctuate by the pushing and pulling of this piston connected to that disc. Now, these fluctuations occur rapidly, like very, very fast, in the same pattern as the sound waves from your voice hitting the disc, converting the sound into electrical signals. And then sending it across the phone line uh, to the switchboard operator who has plugged you in to the person you're trying to talk to. So on their end, they have a receiver. Right. And that receiver essentially is taking that signal and we'll say decoding it, but it wasn't really that complicated. Mm. Uh, that receiver, um, when it was taken off the hook, uh, it, there was literally a hook that held it. If it was one of the two piece, <laughs> you know what they look like. Just watch an old movie. Um, Get off your phone or watch so, it on your phone. <laughs> so when it was taken off the hook, uh, an electrical current started flowing through that earpiece and it had a speaker in it, just a, a pretty basic speaker. Um, and uh, just, I, I guess if you don't know how a speaker works, uh, the current would flow through an electromagnet uh, attached to a disc or diaphragm. Um, and every time an electrical pulse uh, that was being sent uh, from the other phone would go, would travel through this uh, magnet, um, sure. it would vibrate that disc and uh, push the air back and forth, creating sound waves. 
uh, that were mimicking. basically mimicking the exact same sound waves coming in from the the headset part, right? Yep. And Just, so, I guess backwards, but still the same way. And that's how you were able to hear huh. what the other person was saying. Makes sense to me. So over time, um, while the telephone may have gotten a little more complicated in, in terms of how to call someone, uh, first rotary and then touch tone, um, or how to pick up or hang up or how, how the phone call was received, you know, the ringer and all that kind of stuff. That basic uh, idea of electrical signals still never changed. In fact, what they did to kind of upgrade that was they had a, a big switching box um, either at the corner of your block or in front of your house uh, that would convert that signal digitally because you can send those signals much further sure, uh, and much more cleanly. Um, than the analog, just electrical signals. Right, but which would degrade over time and over distance. That idea of of uh, electrical signals, pulses, vibrating a speaker or vibrating a, a talking piece like a microphone is actually, that has not changed one out. Maybe the components have gotten a little better, um, but that is still how phones work today. Uh, there's just a few more bits in between um, that uh, that convert it to this digital signal and either send it through the ground uh, like in the case of a landline or send it through the air like in the case of a cell phone. That's so crazy. I like electronic science to me. Like just because I don't know enough about it, even though I use it every day. (laughs) It's all a wild mystery. I use even analog to digital and digital to analog converters in my recording studio every day. And I still, it just fascinates me that there are engineers out there, electrical engineers out there who know it like the back of their hand and are able to like explain it so much more eloquently than you and I could ever think of. But, uh, more than me, I guess you're really good at it, <laughs> but, but, uh, it, that's what lets us have a job is these whole right. analog signals. Well, I picked up a tape machine a couple weeks ago. You, you know, this sure did it's sitting right beside me. I love it. It's fun. There's a, a certain characteristic you get from magnetic tape, a reel to reel tape machine when you're mixing or, or recording sounds. However, Something I didn't know was that even nicer, bigger reel-to-reel tape machines aren't capable of perfectly capturing and reproducing the sound that comes in and goes out of them because there are so many mechanical parts and pieces that are moving. um, That tape is not going to play back at exactly the same rate that it was recorded. Uh, And I discovered this by taking the exact same piece of audio uh, and and, uh, stacking it. And and syncing it up in your... Got to the end of it. And it, it, I did it three times and they all ended at three different places. And, uh, and that really got me to thinking and, and really appreciating the ability for us to record music digitally because, uh, and I've heard it used before, you know, bits and bytes and sample rates and all that kind of stuff and how important it is that when I record a piece of audio for three minutes that it plays back at exactly three minutes. Right. Um, that was a little bit of a rabbit trail. That's okay. However, back to phones. Get back to the phone. How did we go from from uh, Carol uh, actually, down at the switchboard down at the switchboard um, <laughs> to uh, to these automated? Well, it's exactly that they became um, automated switching uh, units. So automated switching actually allowed people to literally dial a phone number uh, rather than give it to the operator instead of calling old oh, Sally Carol switchboard operator and saying, "Hey, connect me to Doctor Peterson." Uh, you would have Dr. Peterson's phone number and dial it yourself, you lazy bum. Um, and, but the early numbers, get this, and I learned this tonight, thanks to you, Mr. Jones, uh, they were alpha numeric, not just numeric numbers like we have today. Uh, so Mr. Peterson, Dr. Peterson might be PE for Peterson, PE456, and that would have been his number um, up until the 1960s. And then phone numbers were anywhere from one to three digits in length. That's very, that's crazy. May I have your number, please? Sure. Seven. <laughs> <laughs> your number seven. That's nice. <laughs> <laughs> nice to it? meet you. I'm 14. <laughs> <laughs> Twice as good. <laughs> <laughs> ay, ay, ay. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, I, I feel like it kind of goes without saying why numbers are seven digits long now. Uh, and even you can even run into the problem of, well, I do, I get it every, I get calls. Uh, I won't say her name, but I get calls for a lady uh, three or four times every single day. She's a very successful businesswoman. S- smart not saying her name. A higher up at a, uh, at a, a kind of a nearby 
big corporation. Um, and I, un unfortunately, I know a lot about this person um, just from talking to past employers, future employers, and it's amazing how much they'll offer up without having to ask because I don't really care or want to know anything about her. Can I, can I call my old phone number real quick and ask for me? Yes. Can I? Do I've, it. Never, I've never done it. Do it. I'm going to do it right now. Live. This is unscripted. Hold on. I'm putting my little code here. Makes me wonder. I'm going to put it on. If, if my, I, well, I know that my last phone number is not any good anymore. Um, I mean, you hope that that doesn't happen. They, you hope they decommission it, but not always. Okay, hold on. Speaker phone. This is live happening right now. I hope they answer. This is, they're like, I don't recognize this number. <laughs> Probably that's what most people. That's what I do. I only answer numbers. I don't know. The voice not to bleep it out. Hi, this is Robert Venable looking for Robert Venable. <laughs> what if the voicemail? You my have reached the voicemail. I'm gonna hang up so you don't hear that. <laughs> <laughs> what if it was my was my old voicemail? So speaking of um, of of letting phone numbers out on air or in television or in movies, right? This has been a problem in the past and Hollywood has done something to remedy this. Is that correct? <laughs> Absolutely correct. So they took a whole uh, area code out of commission and dedicated it solely to use in um, the film and recording arts. So for film and video and television, and I'm sure you've seen this, they always dial 555, either as the area code or the prefix, 555-3759. Um, like no one will ever have that phone number because 555 is taken out of commission. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, fun fact in the movie, Bruce Almighty that came out in 2003, such a good movie. Um, it starring Jim Carrey and Morgan Freeman. Yep. Uh, Morgan Freeman is God and he pages Jim Carrey in the movie and in the theatrical release of the movie real quick kids, you have to Google what a pager is, but <laughs> it's out there on the internet somewhere. You can find it on your phone. Uh, so he, uh, wow. Um, so it's so true. It's just blowing my mind right now. <laughs> so God calls Jim Carrey's pager and Jim Carrey looks at it and a phone number shows up on the screen. Well, they did their research when they were making the movie and the number did not belong to anyone in the, I believe Buffalo, New York area where the movie takes place. And so they felt safe. They decommissioned that phone number and, uh, and used it just for this movie. Um, the problem is even though that number hadn't been given out to anyone in Buffalo, New York, it, it belonged to thousands of people all throughout the country. And I, I guess not thousands, but several people, um, think of all the different area codes. And, uh, and so people started getting phone calls from others asking to speak with God. <laughs> and, uh, while there are plenty of people I'm sure that played along, uh, there definitely were lots of people who were angry. And so in the DVD release of the movie, uh, and now Blu-ray, if you watch it, it is a 555 number. That's incredible. They went back and changed it. I like post-production stuff and like little Easter eggs like that you can find in the actual like films before they catch it. Yeah. I think it's fun. Uh, well, and sometimes movies are rushed to, to theater uh, yeah. so fast that you'll, there's all kinds of bloopers and, oh, and jump cuts Mistakes. in the theatrical release. Those are my favorite. But then they get cleaned up before it ever releases to... I what, know. What are they released to now? Netflix, Netflix? <laughs> yeah, digital Red release, Box? I guess they call it. Yeah, um, I have a whole bunch of fun facts. We never, I forgot to interject. Can we talk about them? We can. I have one more thing I want to talk about that I thought was crazy. You want to talk about the touch tones or what? The touch tones. Let's talk about the touch tones real quick. So, um, again, if you've ever used a touch tone phone, which is any phone, uh, well, I mean, even your cell phone now, there's still touch tones. If you push a, you hear the noise. But yeah, the beep beep boop. Beep. Yeah. You can play Mary Had a Little Lamb fairly easily. Right, one, two, and six. Um, Three, yeah, six, six, two, one, yeah. So, I think about that. What I did not know until researching for this podcast was that each row and column, uh, each row has its own uh, monophonic frequency, and each column has its own monophonic frequency, and they are standardized. Um, there's even a, a, like a, a, an abbreviation for it, uh, and that's DTMF frequency standards. That's dual tone multi frequency uh, standards. Um, Check in with my head, Jake. So uh, there's it's it goes one two three, and then so also row A. Um, but we'll we'll just for simplicity's sake we'll just go with numbers. So yeah, the ABCD aren't really found on phones much, right? Typically, 
Uh, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, star, zero, pound. And hashtag. Oh, sorry, hashtag. <laughs> <laughs> so it's very important that they are in this specific order. And the reason is uh, numbers one, two, and three have the frequency 697. And I'm not going to list them all. You can Google it. It's not hard to find. But um, each row has uh, has a three-digit frequency. Um, and it's when I say monophonic, that means that it's a pure tone, um, a sine wave. Sure. And then each column has a four-digit frequency, uh, the a one, four, seven, and star. If you're going just the left column, far left column is 1,209 hertz um, is that frequency. And so whenever you press the number one, it's a combination of 697 and 1209 together. And so when you play those two tones at the exact same time, that is the sound you hear when you hear number one. Okay, so it's like a big grid. So one, two, three going across is six ninety seven, and one four seven star going down is twelve oh nine. Correct. So, okay, you just match them up on the grid. Got it. Okay, it makes more sense to me now. You have to see it. So Google this image. I think we should put it up on Instagram. We'll flash it up on the gram. It'd be a good one. We'll do that. Um, um and Facebook and Twitter if we can remember to do that too. Uh, and you'll see what we're talking about. But it's a big grid, so you just correlate the the east and west, the north and south, and it'll tell you what frequency that it's uh it's playing. Yeah, and if you've ever done grids in math class, yeah, it's just like that. Um, so whenever you're able to play Mary Had a Little Lamb, you're hearing the the tone you're hearing is the the average or median tone for the it's the the two frequencies together. The sum. The sum tone, uh, and it creates a uh a polyphonic sound uh that that sounds like those notes. Got it. That makes so much more sense because like it bugged me that it wasn't three, two, one for Mary Had a Little Lamb. Three, two, one is six, two, one. Right? Yeah, it's because of the way it works out mathematically and um, melodically. But yeah, so uh, rather than, I mean, it keeps them from having to have, let's see, uh, if we use ABC, it's one, two, three, four by one, two, yeah, four by four. So rather than having to have 16 different tones, uh, they only have to have eight. And, eight. Uh, and they're able to combine them glorious and, and make all this tone so i thought that was really interesting uh, so it what was. all that does is it tells the switchboard when you dial that series of numbers um what number you're trying to connect to because of the frequency of waveform of electrical signals it's receiving it's able to tell what you're what, what you push it doesn't like sit there and listen for sounds it looks for um on off signals sent by the electrical sound wave wow yeah anyway i have a ton of facts and you and i should go through them. i put them here in the notes did you know that the very first phone call made March 10th, 1876 from uh, in, in Boston, Massachusetts from Alexander Graham Bell to his assistant uh, named Thomas A. Watson? Do you know what he said? He goes, Watson, come here. I want you. <laughs> that was the very first thing he said on this phone call. <laughs> and that's probably grained somewhere in, or that's probably etched somewhere yeah. in stone. <laughs> very first words ever Watson, uttered. Watson, come here. I want you. So deep, so deep. She said, she said so much without saying anything at all. She said so, so little by saying so much. <laughs> there you I go. Don't know. Said I don't know nothing at all by using so many words. Um, fun fact: cell in cell phone is not for the battery. Cell actually has to do with the cells on geographically on a grid. The hexa hexagonal, the hexagonal cells uh, that the grid is divided up into. Um, each cell has its own tower, uh, and they call them masts sometimes. Yep. Uh, a cell tower mast. Um, and when you're within that cell, your phone will connect to that tower. Um, but when you place a phone call through your cell phone, while it uses, uh, you know, just like we talked about how it, the vibrations and electrical signals, that conversion into digital signal now happens straight within your, your phone. Uh, that digital signal is then sent to an antenna within your phone. Now they're in your phone. They used to be outside. You used to have to pull it up. You remember that? I used to work at a little kiosk in the mall and would replace them with ones that lit up. <laughs> <laughs> the reception sucked on them, but it, they looked really cool. But it looked cool. Yeah. Anything else matter when you're 16 years old trying to impress a girl? Right. Uh, so so that <laughs> that call goes to the nearest tower, which is not really that far away. From there, though... It goes via fiber optic underground T1 or T3 cables. 
to a, a essentially a switching station um, that then sends it out to whatever region that you're re, that the other person is in, and it can do this several times till it gets to where they're at. And yeah. then what I think is incredibly interesting is it gets to the closest switching station to the person you're trying to call. And from there, it uses the cell towers to figure out where you are to triangulate mm-hmm. your location so that it knows which tower to send. Again, fiber optic underground. It'll send your call up into that particular tower and then beam it to your phone. Yeah, this- And it's because of this cell network, uh, there are 800 roughly 800 frequencies that a given phone call could be on uh, per tower. Right. And but so that's why there's so many towers. Don't, don't start freaking out. Like, well, there's more than 800 people that live near this tower. Well, that's why they have other towers. And some of them are disguised. Like in Phoenix, we had them disguised as cacti. Really? They'd be big, like metal cacti in the field of no cacti. Way. I say field in the desert <laughs> of cacti. <laughs> Um, you'd see one that's a little taller than the rest, and you could see a little no antenna sticking on the top. Yeah, it's crazy. Well, uh, so I, because I'm just totally a nerd and into true crime podcasts, and I love serial, uh, one of the big pieces of evidence that was able to get Adnan Syed a new trial was from AT&T, stating oh, that yeah. incoming calls are not necessarily accurate for location. Um, outgoing calls can be, but not incoming. And the reason is because your tower could be jammed up with uh, with all 800 lines, especially in a busy city like Baltimore, where this sure. crime took place, uh, could be jammed up with calls. And so it may send your call from a further away tower. It'll relay it to another one still closer to you or close to you than others, but maybe one of the less busy. And so, uh, so yeah, so that's how cell phones work. Um, and that's not what they're called cell phones. And so your antenna is not really that great. Your cell phone is not beaming a signal into outer space. Which we always say, well, the signal is great considering it's going to outer space and bouncing off a satellite up there somewhere. Right. It's one of my favorite Louis C.K. skits ever. He's like, it has to go to space. Can you give it a second? It's a miracle. <laughs> your, your cell phone, like Verizon sucks, right? That's a skit. Yeah. So funny. Um, But no. Now, there are instances when you're making international calls that, yes, it might have to go into outer space. Um, and uh, what really fascinates me is how all of this happens in fractions of a second. Seconds, for um, sure. All this has to figure out what, what to do, where to go, how to go, where to, and then, bam, your phone starts ringing almost instantly. So if this were back in the day, when you picked up that phone call, not on a cell phone, but just a regular phone, you were patched through, you'd pick up the phone and you'd hear, ahoy! What? That was the original like telephone greeting instead of saying hello. You're kidding. They wanted ahoy, like like uh, sailors and pirates <laughs> they would use um, back on ships, but was later superseded by Thomas Edison, who suggested hello instead. So there was Mr. Bell going, we should use ahoy. And Mr. Edison's going, nah, we'll just say hello. <laughs> okay. I'm going back to, uh, to, to Alexander Graham Bell's ahoy from now on, by the way. Ahoy. Oh, yes, please. <laughs> ahoy. Ahoy. Ahoy, this is Robert. Ahoy. Um, so speaking of Thomas Edison, it is actually his uh, invention of using granulated carbon uh, to send and receive electrical signals that allow the telephone to work. So if we really want to pat anybody on the back, it should be Thomas Edison because the telephone could not have happened had it not been for that invention. Interesting. Did you know that the phrase uh, to put someone on hold was actually Alexander Graham Bell uh, like coined to him handing over his telephone instrument to his partner, Mr. Watson, we talked about earlier, saying, here, hold this. <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, I've got to use the loo. Here, hold this. It's like, I guess you were just put on hold. Man, I really, like, I, I can't help but picture Alexander Graham Bell as Ron Swanson. <laughs> here, hold this. <laughs> That's hilarious. Come here, Watson. I need to see you. Do you want to know um, that I found out that uh, according to the 1945 edition of Who's Who, that Adolf Hitler's home phone number uh, was Berlin 11 6191. What? So if you have that number now (laughs) and you're getting some calls from a guy, (laughs) now you know why. Surely not. Surely that number's long gone. Well, of course it is because they they use more numbers than that, more digits. (laughs) Uh, But man, whoever had that number after him, like, no, he's not here. Yeah. Hello? Ahoy? 
Ahoy. <laughs> my, also, my German accent sucks. <laughs> There is Hitler. <laughs> He's not here right now. Can I take a message? Oh, man. Um, oh, I learned that also in the early days that telephone wires were ranked according to how tasty they were to mice and rats. What? They somehow had like a rating system um, by how often that rats and mice and other rodents um, would jump underground or to where the wires were, climb the poles and chew on them and like nope nope those won't last very long let's get thicker gauge oh man that's a bad day for a mouse or rat i I mean sometimes so as history would have it mark twain the famous author was one of the very first to have a telephone in his home ahoy ahoy mr twain here (laughs) you've reached twain five seven (laughs) thanks for calling tw five seven Oh, man. Um, so the very first phone book in history, and this is I'm, I'm a stretch of the term here, phone book, was only one page long. Oh, wow. Understandably. I mean, you can't imagine there being... Yeah. Well, I mean, the digits were only one to three. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> here are all 999 of them on one page. So pay phones are actually still used by a very small percentage, 5% of the, of the world population today, uh, at least once a year. And I can imagine all of them are after they've murdered someone and are calling their pickup. Man, did you ever have a Nokia cell phone? Like the brick? Uh, I didn't have the brick. Like 5150 or a I did have a Nokia 31. for a little while. Actually, that was my last uh, dumb phone was a Nokia. <laughs> Less smartphone. Be PC about this. Sorry. Um, so the uh, memorable Nokia tone for receiving an SMS text message, um, the SMS text messages uh, is, is actually Morse code for SMS. It went, Beep, 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 beep. I don't know if you remember that. Like when you got an yep. SMS message, that was what it was. It's Morse code for SMS. You'll still hear it in movies. Um, yeah, exactly. From, from that era. And then there's also this one that sounds a lot like that, but it's a lot longer. <laughs> it's called ascending. So if you go into like tone notifications and change that sound to ascending on the Nokia so, uh, phones, um, it's actually Morse code for quote, connecting people, end quote, which was their uh, slogan. Wow. Yeah. And then like if you just got a regular text message, not the SMS one, um, it would just be beep beep, which is M in Morse code for message. Wow. I guess all those old sailors are like, I get it. I get it. <laughs> <laughs> Getting a message. Uh, so, uh, fun fact, Nokia was founded in 1865. And do you know what they made? It wasn't cell phones. Obviously not in 1865. Probably it, cell, cell typewriters. Paper. Uh, I was close. Paper was its primary business. Uh, many Thunder years Mifflin later, style. Right. <laughs> uh, many years later, it switched to making rubber products, uh, telegraph wires, and other electrical cables, and then switched over into making phones. I see how they're very like similar markets from the tele- telegraph wires and electrical cables right into telephones. Right, it makes sense. Um, so did you know? And we talked about this. I know you know, but do you know? I'm looking at the microphone as I say this, um, which is going into your ear holes. Uh, about gold in your cell phones and like the amount of gold in your cell phones. So um, one ton of mobile phones contains more gold than at one ton of ore from a gold mine. Wow. And that blew my mind. And this, this, this kind of uh, little fuse and made me go down a rabbit hole on the internet to find out, well, just how much gold is that? Like maybe an, uh, a ton of gold from a gold mine or a ton of ore from a gold mine gold mine doesn't yield that much gold so i'm like well let's see how much it is and i actually looked up how much gold is in a smartphone and in very rough numbers there are 10 troy ounces of gold uh just about a little over half a pound three-fifths of a pound per ton of smartphones a ton is two thousand pounds so ten thousand cell phones equal about one ton (laughs) <laughs> so with the current rate, as of the time of this podcast, down to the hour, with gold selling for about $1,328 per ounce, that would yield 13280 bucks for 2,000 pounds of cell phones or 10,000 cell phones. So about $1.33 per phone. Whoa. It's like $1.20. I mean, $1.32.8 or something like that. Man. Uh, so if you started collecting all these broken cell phones that don't work and just save them up, Eventually, you can get yourself thirteen grand. <laughs> my my wheels initially, I mean, instantly started spinning. Like, huh? Start a a you know used broken cell phone collection. 
But no, I don't think I want. That's a lot of cell. Ten thousand cell phones. I don't think I want ten thousand cell phones laying around. I mean, you don't need that many. You can just get one cell phone and have a dollar thirty three worth of gold. Or I could have like a thousand dollars worth of phone, if it worked. Oh my! It, it works now. I guess. Yeah, I guess you're right. But if you ever get sick of that phone and you're like, I'm tired of my thousand dollar cell phone. I want a dollar thirty three. <laughs> I'd like to cash this in, please, sir. <laughs> to your local jeweler. <laughs> what can I get for this? <laughs> Jeez, man. Uh, okay, so in 2012, Apple sold more than 340,000 iPhones per day. So I was about to say, duh. I have, they probably sold twice that, but you said per day, so that blows my mind. That is about four phones a second. More than a million every three days. That's ridiculous. So uh, Apple, while their while their um, their profits have increased year over year consistently, and still have increased, their cell phone sales peaked in 2015 and have, yeah, I've have started that. dropping. And the way that they've been able to keep their sales numbers high, uh, their financial sales high, uh, is because the iPhone is so freaking expensive. That and they programmed into their phones to start dying faster. So you have to pay to get them repaired or battery replaced or buy a new phone. Well, so the conspiracy theorist sitting across from me would say that, but something I... They admitted to that. That's been proven. Yeah, this has been proven. Oh, because They came out and apologized and entered it, uh, like even issued an update for phones that had that currently. Oh, I know what you're talking about. I know what you're talking about. Yes. They call it like battery gate or something. It's stupid. What I was talking about was the actual hardware itself is made so well... Uh, oh. And continues to get better and better that people are hanging on to their phones longer and longer. Um, no, I was talking about that. Have they conditioned it after a year of use for the battery to start dying faster? Right. Yeah. Or acting like it was dying faster or something like that. Well, because I knew that there was like a code you could type in. Oh. Uh, there, there was like a thing you could do on your phone um, pre them fixing this. Uh, and it was like emergency battery or whatever. And it was oh, like yeah. half your freaking battery. Like, where did this come from? Right. More flappy birds for me. Because <laughs> this is an emergency. <laughs> Level 157 isn't going to solve itself. Duh. Dude. Did you know there's an actual name for being addicted to your cell phone? No. Like being addicted to mobile phones is called nomophobia, which sounds like to me you've been cured of something. I got nomophobia, but it's co- literally called nomophobia. <laughs> N-O-M-O phobia. <laughs> and that's being uh, addicted to your cell phone. So mobile phones have 18 times more bacteria than, take a guess, than non-mobile phones. <laughs> <laughs> Can't take those into the bathroom. My guess would have been a door handle. Computer keyboard. Times, right? That's a good guess. Uh, mobile phones have 18 times more bacteria on them than toilet handles. Yep. That's disgusting. That's absolutely disgusting. Although I do Lysol in my bathroom fairly regularly. I'm like weird about germs. Hey, want to borrow my phone? Absolutely not. <laughs> and that's a weird, okay, <laughs> you don't have a problem with this. And there's certain people I don't have a problem with it with. Like I would trust your, your ears and my wife and the kids. Outside of that circle, not very many people would, if they handed me either A, their phone to put up to my face, I either hold it away or earbuds. Put it on speakerphone. Yeah. The earbuds thing is a very personal thing. Yeah, the earbuds thing. And people thing. are like, here, listen to this. And they, they, hand, they force it to you. It's like that thing's been crammed in your ear for hours and hours and hours when you work out and you sweat and you eat and you poop. And, and earwax you... and earwax and earwax. And like they start putting it in your ear for you. I'm like, I'm good. I know how earbuds work. I just don't want them in my ears. I'll just pull them out here. I like the speaker experience. <laughs> I feel like they sound more real if they have a little bit of air you before gotta, they hit your ear. got to push some air with those sound waves. So please play from a distance. <laughs> maybe, maybe play it through this aux cable. Be right. Great. So that's it. Um, of course, there's tons more information. Um, I encourage you, if this is something that you found fascinating, hit up Google. Uh, you'll find all kinds of really cool, uh, fun facts about phones and how phones work. Um, believe it or not, most of this information is really just kind of in a nutshell, even as, as detailed as we got. Um, there's there, if you're, I don't know, a science nerd like me, I'll probably spend 10 more hours looking this right. up because. <laughs> I'm now like, well, wait, but how, how does, how does, what, how, who, here's the dial tone and the touch tones and who, like, what, what's the machine? How does it know that who you're trying to call and how does it know where to send it that? So all kinds of fun, interesting facts. Um, but, but, uh, that is, that is roughly 
how phones work. And, uh, and so now next time you're talking to someone, you'll know kind of how, how it's, uh, how it's going and how the FBI will be able to track you dun, dun, um, dun, 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 dun. in your location. Yeah. That's scary. <laughs> I mean, but also, uh, on the flip side of that, if you are the one that's the victim, they might be able to find you. Right. Which has happened as well. Or Alexa might just record the, the, the whole crime. Oh, and just tell everything that they know. Right. Or Alexa. Such a witness to so many things. Ugh. Did you know, I think I told this story, maybe even on the podcast before, but I had a recording studio uh, just about 10 years ago, nine years ago, um, downtown um, in Franklin, Tennessee, just south of Nashville. And uh, one night I was there mixing, nine or 10 at night, I get a knock on the door of the studio. I'm like, well, that never happens. Um, knocks on the door of the studio do happen from time to time with people trying to give me demos or whatever this Google studios and find me and show up. Um, but not at 10 o'clock at night. I answer the door and it's a cop, not one cop, several cops. And as I'm looking like past him to see, wow, there are more cops. Um, there are cops in the whole driveway, like going down the line, like there are lots of cops here. <laughs> and they said that they were responding to a 911 hang up call of someone whose cell phone was traced um, back behind my recording studio. Uh, I'm going, okay. I don't know if that's like a, a scare tactic or even real, or if they were even able to do that on such short notice, like triangulate and know where they were um, or not. But I didn't have anybody there, but there was a shed back there and I was leasing the property and that shed belonged to my landlords. So they kept like old music gear and uh, lawn equipment and stuff in this huge shed and said, we need you to open up that shed. I'm like, I don't know if I've ever opened it before. Let me go get the key out of the special key hiding spot inside the studio. I'm like, do you guys want to look in here? I promise I'm not hiding anybody. I have nothing. I'm scared as you are right now. <sighs> um, like, no, we need you to open it. I'm like, here's the key. You do it. I'm like, nope, you need to open it. Like you're I'm wearing like, protective gear and like, you have guns. I'm just, I'm, I'm just a dude. A dude. <laughs> I'm a dude wearing a white t-shirt and umbro shorts. <laughs> Thought I'd be mixing by myself all night. Um, so I opened up the, the padlock and I mean, they had to be thinking, man, this dude with tattoos and spiky hair and stuff showing up uh he could be hiding somebody in here and got her padlocked in there i'm assuming it's a her i don't really know um and so i open up the padlock open i swing open the door and hide behind it like so there's a door between me and the inside of the place because i'm like if there's something in there i don't want to be the first line of defense (laughs) so yeah and there's nothing there and then they just they didn't even like continue to investigate like all right well thank you and they left i'm like Uh. That's really odd. Aren't you concerned about this person who hung up right back here? There has to be somebody here. Sounds to me like they were looking for something else. Yeah, I don't know. And the thing is, the guy who owned the property right next to us was growing that in their back place. Oh, man. Um, And he had offered it to us several times, and I don't smoke anything. So uh, he kept telling me how good it was for his cancer and all this kind of stuff. And if I ever need it, I would find it. But he'd be there at like later hours than me. Like, And there are weird noises coming from his big, giant... Oh, uh, yeah, storage unit. Anyway, so triangulation is a thing. Could save, could help, could hinder, whatever. Right? That's uh, a long story to tell nothing about. But. Twice in my life, small children have dialed 911 on my phone. Weird. And hung up, and then the police show up. On a cell phone? On a cell phone. Now, like, it's crazy that they know that. Because I remember calling 911 once from a cell phone, and they asked where I was. I'm like, don't you know that? Right. Or is this a test? Right, I think it's... <laughs> no, I really do actually think it's a... Like a, like a, just making sure. Well, they ask lots of questions, right? Sure. They can, they can usually tell a lot by your answers. Um, I get, yeah, absolutely. They're not necessarily listening to the words you're saying. I, I know. Yeah, I, I get you. Um, but yeah, uh, one of those times was two o'clock in the morning and my three year old dialed 911 and uh, my wife answered and told the operator what had happened. It was three year old and, and, uh, they just said, oh, okay, thanks. I thought, oh, cops are definitely showing up. 2 a.m. Parent says it was a three-year-old playing with their phone. Come on. Likely story. If I were ever to commit a crime, that's what I would say. Sorry, my son hit the button. Anyway, have a good night. So that happened to me on my phone uh, with one of my friend's kids. Uh, I'd been staying at their house. He was probably two or three years old. Dials 911. I catch it. Uh, similar situation, grab the phone, wait for them to answer, which was very quick. Told them what happened. They said, okay, thank you. Hung up. Police officer shows up at the door 10 minutes later. It's like, do you mind if I just kind of walk around? Just want to make sure everything's okay. 
I would rather that happen than the other. Me too. To be honest. Absolutely. Um, but it was like, oh, it's because I'm a dude. Yeah, I get it. You were stereotyped, bro. <laughs> Man. I'm not mad about it. So many like stories we could tell about phones. And I'd like to hear your stories. If you have them, tweet us, Instagram us, Facebook us, at Turned Up Podcast. Any crazy stories? Uh, I've actually had my line tangled up when it was switching towers and throw me on the same frequency as someone else. Dude, I've done that too. And you start hearing someone else talking. I sat there and listened to someone else's conversation. On, on a cell phone. It, it, I just sat there and let it happen. I mean, this was like a decade ago. So. And these are radio waves. I mean, th- this is... Uh, um, what it, magnetic radiation radio it's, waves uh, sure and it's a lot like the the waves used in a microwave but a lot scarcer uh, lower frequency so you don't have to worry about it causing tumors it's just not at gonna, least we don't think so we'll all, find we'll find out eventually uh, right <laughs> all the research that that I did in the way those waves work uh, point to it, them not being focused enough think of a magnifying glass in the sunshine, trying to burn a hole in a leaf or an ant or whatever you used to do when you were a kid. And the more focused you made that little light beam, the more it'd burn. And if otherwise, it doesn't burn at all. Like you can have the sunshine th- shining through a magnifying glass on your hand and not feel it. But you move your hand away until it gets focused like a little dot and all of a sudden it burns like crazy. Same way these, these, the frequency of these radio waves are working, the really, really, really focused ones, um, like your microwave uses or other ones like lasers, uh, will or X-rays or X-ray oh, X-rays is a perfect example. Um, can break up your DNA, which is what causes the the mutations and cancer cells to happen or whatever. But what happens if you stay in the sun too long? Uh, I'm not talking about sun rays. I'm talking about you, you get a sunburn. Not even, uh, yes, and those that gives too. you cancer. I'm just saying. But I'm cell talking phones, about the broader range, lower frequencies. We're all going like to be walking around. FM. Listen, two generations from now, we're all going to have three eyes. I am looking forward to that. <laughs> Or if you listen to our episode, we already have a third eye where our belly button is. That's, <laughs> that's our last episode. <laughs> oh, man. We have to give a lot of shout outs. Oh, we should give a shout out to... Uh, we have a new podcast friend. We do. We have um, a couple of them, actually. Uh, but w- I want to shout out Dad's Drinking Bourbon. Um, not only am I a dad that drinks bourbon, but there are other... There's actually a podcast called Dad's Drinking Bourbon. And uh, Zeke and John over there are doing good things. Uh, they're hilarious. They know what they're doing. And uh, they know what they're talking about. Great podcast. Uh, check out those guys. Also, check out your BFF podcast. And that is uh, um, a couple of lovely ladies. Uh, Jen and Music City Mel, one word. You should look them up. Um, but your BFF podcast. And they're just a couple of girls, uh, BFFs. And they're talking about everything in life that uh, the ladies want to know about and talk about and gossip about. And uh, it's actually really entertaining even for guys. I would say it's really, it's really, and it's really informative if you're a guy and you want to know how to better communicate with ladies. You can learn how they communicate and be like, got it. I know what really matters now. And that's your BFF? Your BFF podcast. And uh, dad's drinking bourbon. But so shout out to all of those people, very lovely people and friends of ours um, that we have recently uh, got to meet. And if you're just struggling to find them on social media, you can find them through our social media um, at Turned Up Podcast. That's Instagram and Twitter, Facebook.com slash Turned Up Podcast. Um, also, huge shout out to our patrons. Oh, yes. Uh, we have a list of several of them here. Uh, uh, top 10. Go for it. For the week of March 4th, 2019. Yes. People who have communicated with us and our patrons. XOB cry. Um, Laura. Oh, my brain just freaked out. I was going to say Laura Ann, but it's Laura Ann Elise seven. <laughs> Samantha Seeger. <laughs> Natalie B. Hey, Natalie. Jen Walter one, who was just in the studio last week. Yeah, she was here for the last episode. Uh, Josiah eight two zero. MD Biaco. Kate oh, sorry. Biaco. Biaco. Get it right or pay the price. Salute your shorts. Katie Mouse seven one three. Michael J83, hit us up, man. Davin C. Casey, what's up, dude? Uh, and uh, if you would like to become a patron, get a shout out, get a cool sticker, maybe come sit in on, a, on an episode, uh, record an intro to the show, have a super sweet turned up mug. Um, you can do that by visiting turnedupodcast.com, looking in the upper right corner and just clicking the button that says become a patron. Uh, that we, have, we have packages starting at five bucks a month. 
um, all the way up to uh, like a thousand. It's like three thousand one hundred and ninety-two dollars a month, something like that. It doesn't go to three thousand one hundred ninety-three. It's weird. Oh, man, just kidding. I don't know what it is. Um, but if you're, you're going to donate that much, flare up. Yeah, talk talk to us behind the scenes, and we'll figure out how to make it happen. If you want to give more than that, listen. We love you so much. Huge shout out also to Real Sound for making this podcast possible. Cool things coming down the pipe with them. Hey, Real Sound, how are you doing? And uh, uh, we love you very much. Thank you for giving us your time and lending us your ear. And we can't wait to chew it off again next week. But until then, this is Nashville signing out. Peace. Peace.